<laughs> Come on. What makes Britain British? Is it the landscape? Is it the people? Is it the food? Is it the traditions? Well, the truth is, it's all of those things. But I'm slightly concerned that we're losing touch with some of our food and traditions. So I've set off on a little journey to find them all. In today's show, the last in my series, I go to a brewery and get into a spot of bother. Oh, 56! She's gonna blow! She's gonna blow! I slurp a shellfish down at the seashore. Should we have one there? I think we ought to. <laughs> And from the kitchen in my caravan, I cook up a dish for some dancers with equine interests. Right. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> uh, it's not quite ready, I'm afraid. <laughs> Today, I'm in Kent. The Garden of England. As Mr Jingle said in Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, Kent, sir. Everybody knows Kent. Apples, cherries, ops and women. Not quite sure if he used that accent. But anyway, we know the women are still here. Let's check if they've still got the apples, cherries and hops. Kent lies to the southeast of England and is the closest county to Europe. Its warm climate and abundance of orchards and hop fields gave it the name the Garden of England. It also has a huge coastline boasting the white cliffs of Dover and countless fishing villages and seaside towns. As well as attracting millions of visitors, Kent has also been the inspiration for artists and writers alike. J.M.W. Turner painted landscapes here and Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales was about pilgrims travelling to Canterbury Cathedral. But even more than that, Kent has some very interesting claims to fame. Henry VIII used to stay here at Leeds Castle. And the first ever white road lines in the UK were painted in Kent. All in all, it's quite the county. It's the thing about Kent is everywhere you look, they're growing something else. They've got rhubarb, they've got marrows, they've got cabbages, they've got strawberries and raspberries, apples, hops. Here I am in Kent, and what's Kent most famous for? Hops. And what are hops most famous for? Making beer. Hooray! Beer is the third most widely drunk thirst quencher in the world. In fact, only water and tea come ahead of it. And here in Britain, it's our speciality. We have more than 700 dedicated brewers making more than 2,000 different types of beer every year. Hops are one of the main ingredients, and as Kent is renowned for growing some of the best aromatic hops, you'd expect there to be quite a few breweries here. And you'd be right. 22, in fact. And the oldest of them all is Shepherd Neem in Faversham. It still uses traditional brewing methods and gets all its water from its very own well. Stuart Tricker is the senior brewer, taking time out to show me around. Hi, Stuart. Good morning. I'm Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Very pleased to meet you. This is Adrian. one of my favourite places. Um, beer is, to my mind, the best drink in the world. Excellent. Um, got a very ancient history, hasn't it? When did it come into Britain? It came into Britain with hops in about 1400s, something like that. Was we it only that recently? It, I mean, that seems yeah. quite recent. I thought it was kind of... Well, it goes back further than that, but without hops, you're then back into the worlds of meads and... Right. And ale, because strictly ale doesn't have hops in it and beer does. Right. Um, but we've been here since 1698, we know, because that's how far back we've, we've had tax bills. But there's, <laughs> there's evidence the brewery goes back before those days. Yeah. And obviously it's cited here because we've got our own water source here. Yeah. You are the oldest brewery in Britain? We are the oldest brewery in, right. in Britain. Well, let's have a look. Let's make some beer. Excellent. 300 years ago, deliveries to and from the brewery were made by horse and cart on a dray. That's a flatbed wagon. The draymen used to come back at the end of the day having had a pint in every pub. Yeah. And the horses really brought them on, home on their own. And as you can see, they didn't always get it quite right. And so that, all, all, all this damage is drunken draymen? Well, we believe so, yes. <laughs> I'd quite like to be a drayman. <laughs> 
I'm here to find out what goes into my pint of bitter. And maybe, just maybe, there's a chance of a taste test. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, isn't it? It does pass the time, I suppose. <laughs> First thing we need to know, really, is what is beer? Beer is a fermented product, primarily made from malted barley. Right. So it, it's a very simple set of chemicals. You have malted barley, you have some yeast, and we have hops. And what is malted barley? It's barley that's been taken from the fields, and then it, it's gone through the start of the germination process so that the enzymes have, have become active. Right. A true brewer can select and know what's happening purely by chewing it and seeing how, uh, really? how good it is. And you know, yeah. It'll give you the flavour. Um, obviously, the darker the barley is, the, the more flavours there are. How do you think people first discovered that that would make a delicious drink? We think it's probably pure luck. You know, yeah. They'd left something in a bucket, it got wet and it got warm, and then typical humans, they tasted it and thought, that's yeah, all right. That's all right. We'll have some more of that. Yeah. We'll open a pub. <laughs> right, so we've got the ingredients, now let's find out how it's made. It starts with the mash tun, an old-fashioned traditional mixing drum. This one is the oldest of its kind in the country, nearly a hundred years old. And we're mixing a beer called Spitfire. <clears> throat's feeling a bit dry. Too early for a sample. So we've got our empty mash tun. Yep. What do we put in it? We well, put it in our malted barley, obviously. Exactly, and we're going to put it in, mix in with water at about 60 degrees. Right. Very technically, you have to adjust the water based on, you've got hot water at 80, cold water, mix the two together, hit bang on 60. Get the consistency right. If it's too runny, yeah. it'll come over the top. If it's too thick, it'll set like a rock. So right. there's a true art to doing it. You don't want to porridge, it. you don't want to gruel. That's right. So there's this enormous vessel with all these kind of slots in it, and we're going to pour the multi barley in and some water and basically the water's going to drip through those slots so it's acting like an enormous tea bag. Exactly. It'll go through the bottom, all of the grain will stay behind and the bit on top will rotate and spray it or sparge yeah. with hot water to wash the rest you of the just sugar think out. You a new word for everything in the English language, I don't you? I certainly do. There's, there's no real words left. No, that's right. Wort and sparge. Well, we'll find some more in a little while. <laughs> well, I'm sure I could come up with a couple of words after a pint or two. Now, Stuart's right-hand man, Mark, is going to make me his right-hand man to regulate the temperature. Very important job. I'm in charge of the cold tap. Open it up fully, yeah, and then you cut it back afterwards. Keep going. Oh, here he comes. So it's up to 60 now. 63, 63 degrees is what you're aiming for. Might need to start cutting that back a bit now. I'm feeling the responsibility very, very badly. That's almost off. Yeah, that's all right. There's back up 63. Yeah. Oh, 65. Oh, oh, oh. Right. 66. <laughs> She's going to blow. She's going to blow. <laughs> this is better than video games. And there we are. That's our mash. That's your mash. That's the start of 110 barrels of Spitfire. 110 barrels is only after a pint. After the sugars are extracted from the barley, the mixture is called wort and is then piped into huge tanks called coppers, which are made of steel. So these are all coppers. What happens in a copper? The copper's the boiling process. Wow! Yeah, they're hot. They're quite hot, aren't they? So they're actually going to boil it at about 101, 102 degrees. And it'll also sterilise the wort. It's why wort is good to drink, and it's why even in the days when water was bad, you were safe if you drank in a brewery because it's been boiled and sterilised. Yeah, because people used to drink, in Dickens' time, they used to drink what was called a small beer, which was a beer which was not small in size, but had a small alcohol level, didn't it? That's right, Because it was yes. safer, than, safer than water. Much, much safer than water. Yeah. So you've got the wort, which is the beer juice, yep. um, in there, boiling away merrily, that's it. And this is when you add the hops? It is when we add the hops. And right. we add pelletised hops like these, yeah. which will go in via the uh, little hopper there just to get them in without hops having to open the hopper. door. Hops in a hopper. <laughs> and we're going to add anything. Some brews will take 40 or 50 kilos of hops at this stage. Right. So quite a lot of What does hops. the hop do It gives, gives the bitterness and it also gives a lot of the aroma. 
Right. Uh, you add hops late in the process, so towards the end of the copper boil, to get the aroma, because otherwise it just goes off and out the chimney and makes Faversham smell nice. Yeah. Um, but it, earlier in the process, the hops actually give the bitterness. And bitterness is the great thing in beer that you, drink, you primarily taste at the back of your throat, so you yeah. have to swallow beer. You yeah. can't spit it out like wine, you have to, sw to swallow it. Well, that's the kind of taste testing I like. Speaking of which, we're nearly there yet. So here we are in a kind of cathedral of fermentation vessels. That's right. So the, the wort's gone into the vessels now with the yeast, and it's going to spend about five days in here actively fermenting to change yeah. the sugar into alcohol. Then we'll chill it down, the yeast will drop to the bottom of the vessels and we can crop it off to reuse it. Yeah. The beer will sit and mature for a couple of days and then it's ready to drink. Brilliant. So that whole process from putting it into the mash tun takes about six, seven days. Six or seven days for a cask ale. Nice. Let's go and taste some. Ideal. Oh, I've been looking forward to this. Not desperate, mind you, just looking forward. Uh, which one should we taste? Well, I think Canterbury Jack would give you a, a quite a good example. It's one of our newer beers with a very fruity, grapefruity aroma. Grapefruit in a beer? Fruit in beer? That's wrong, isn't it? Well, it's coming from the hops. Let's have a taste. Mm. I have to say, even before you put it in your mouth, you can, you can smell the hops on that, can't you? There are. Ooh, the a hops, lot of hops on that. I mean, that's the thing about beers, isn't it? I mean, what makes them all taste so different? An awful lot of it comes down to the hops that are used. Yeah. I mean, basically, you're just using malt, malted hops and <laughs> malted barley and water. That's and right. And then the hops are the only flavouring ingredient. The hops, the mix of the barley and the yeast. Each brewer's yeast gives a slightly different flavour. Doesn't it? But the hops are what give the beers their characteristic aroma. Yeah. Mmm. Mmm. Life is brilliant, isn't it? This is my job. This is your job this is as well. my job, yes. This is your job every day of the year. That's right. You've got a better job than me. Hmm. Must change careers. Try another one? Yeah, let's try another one. Finish this one first. Okay, if you hold it up a bit higher. Marvellous. That's a cracker. And it worked. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that hops have antioxidants in them uh, which help against heart attacks and cancer and they've proven that when you've drunk some beer you have more antioxidants in your system and that's why I drink beer mummy yes it's for health